that there is no limit. There is no limit to what we can do with our health. There is no limit to who we can become. And working with people in the industry, um, you know, I've spent the last 30 years really in the field of integrative healthcare, working in any number of areas. And in doing so, have had a school for 19 years teaching physicians, nurses, occupational therapists, massage therapists, and so forth, how to support others in really healing themselves by recognizing not the symptoms, but the cause of disease. And what we have seen is that in Western medicine or, or the developed Western medicine at the moment, what has happened is that we deal with the physical presentation of illness as if that was the illness itself. When in fact, physical manifestation is simply the result of a symptom. All disease begins on an energetic or vibrational level. And if you think about that, you know when you feel high energy, when you feel alive and you feel vibrant, that everything in you, your shoulders are back, you're full of life and everything in you fills you with health. What ends up happening However, is over time, sometimes stresses come in, sometimes belief systems come in and we start shrinking. And literally it's, it's visible. When we start shrinking and bring ourselves down, what ends up happening is that we suppress the ability for our lungs, we, for our hearts and our organs, as well as our systems to function. It's really amazing to me, you know, spirit works in the strangest of ways that what happened just a few minutes before I came on this call, I was on another call and someone said to me, they asked us to mention something about ourselves. And one man who was there said, I joined this call because two years ago, Dr. Dorothy saved my wife's life. And you step back sometimes, you know, when we do things and don't realize the impact of our work. And I think that's all of us. And he went on to say, he was a physician from LA, and he said that two years ago, my wife developed something akin to COVID, but before COVID was here. And it went from her lungs into her kidneys, and her kidneys started shutting down. And so she was placed in the hospital in LA, and he had heard about me through the grapevine, through my reputation. And he called, and in working with him and his wife who could talk when she was lucid, if you will, she was really in and out. Um, I worked with them, kidney failure, <laughs> kidney issues, a fear around an inability. You know, I want privacy. You mute yourselves unless you had a question. I'm sorry, was there a question there? All right, so in any event, with all, and I'll be going through this, but every symptom we have, whether it's organic or systemic, every issue has an emotional base. Kidney disease or kidney disorders are fear around an inability to protect ourselves. And what ended up happening was just before this went on, this woman had a situation in her business in which she felt terrified that she would lose her business and translated that into how would she protect herself? How could she support herself? How could she become who she truly is if she started to lose her ability to keep a healthy business going? And it ended up resulting in ultimately liver failure. Lung disorders where it started for her was really about the inability to breathe in life and all of its changes. So when somebody develops these disorders, it's fear around an inability to deal with life and all of its changes. And we all have changes coming through our lives constantly. When we don't have that ability to recognize that life is filled with change, we find out if you notice you hold your breath you hold yourself in and you don't allow yourself to truly breathe. It's almost like you're holding your breath, waiting for it to pass. So you don't drown in the midst of these struggles. And that was going on for her. She was holding her breath, developed these lung disorders. It ended up moving down into the kidneys because she was frightened. She couldn't handle this and ended up in the hospital 
All I did in working with her was certainly I did some energy work because I'm a licensed energy practitioner. I did some energy work with her, but mostly worked with her to see how I could support her recognizing where these fears were coming in and how I could best support her. And as I worked with her and helped her deal with her fears, and even if she lost her company, it was simply a company she lost. If she knew how to be a successful entrepreneur, she could do it again if she chose to, or she could move on and do something else, but that there was no need to have such fear that she would be dying underneath all of this. And once we dealt with that, all of a sudden, the doctor started saying, well, it's a miracle, something happened, maybe, which is frequently, maybe we misdiagnosed. Maybe there was something wrong with what we saw in, in, the, in the tests, in the x-rays, in the MRIs, in the CAT scans and all of these things. And she was healed. And her husband to this day is talking about it. I just found it amazing that this is something he reminded me of 15 minutes before we started that I had forgotten about completely, but I thought it really starts off to me as an example of what tonight is all about. And so what I would like to do, as, as I said, is really support you in understanding how our belief systems really impact us energetically. That you know that if you believe life is dangerous. Life is out to get us. And certainly with all the stuff that's going on, especially in this country right now, it's easy to go to that place. But if we go to that place where life is dangerous and then you die, think of how that changes your energetic vibration. Think of how that can cause you to succumb to stress. That can cause you to really shrink and become small. If instead you recognize that life is a gift, it's an adventure and we all have ups and downs. We all run into all kinds of situations and our ability to handle the stresses that come up, our ability to really work with whatever life hands us allows us begin to see that life truly happens for us, not to us. Life does not work against us. It works to support us becoming more and more of to me, what we're meant to be. I truly see this as an absolute spiritual journey and a spiritual journey that calls us to continuously become, that calls us to recognize within ourselves the dreams we have. And every time we recognize the dreams within us and we work towards them, even if we don't achieve those dreams, the process of working towards those dreams calls us to come alive. It calls us to begin to see the possibility in life. It calls us to make amazing decisions to go forward. And as we continuously go forward, as we continuously become more excited about something that's working, all of a sudden you start feeling better. And if there's something going on, you notice chronic diseases start to be minimized. You notice the impact of the chronic diseases start to be minimized. And we know here in this culture right now that over 80% of our diseases are because of lifestyle whether we are talking cholesterol, whether we are talking high blood pressure, we are talking diabetes, we are talking arthritis. So much of this is lifestyle induced. And that includes our belief systems, our emotional frame of mind and how it presents itself physically. And these are generalizations. We'll go into the personal pieces. I'll be doing a PowerPoint going into how it affects each personality and each leadership style. But this is just in general information that it happens that if you notice all the diseases or accidents that have taken place in your life, and then notice what was going on when those diseases or accidents took place, you're going to be seen to see that there's a clear pattern. Nothing happens out of context. It always happens within a context. And I would like to begin to show you some of that, to show you how your personality and leadership style, and as a leader, our personality comes out. You know this, no matter where you go, you show up. Our personality shows up wherever we go, especially in our leadership, so that it impacts us positively or negatively. It, it, uh, you have to have a sense of humor because life is an amazing adventure. So let's get started. 
Let me see here. Somebody wanted, just as I was doing this, wouldn't you know if somebody wanted to come in? There we go. All righty. So let's get started in sharing this. Okay, here we go. The adventures, look at all of this, the things we can do, the things we can start with. Look at this individual right here and notice what his personality must be like. Somebody who is willing to take a risk and go riding over waves and take it. Somebody else would be saying, there isn't a chance in Hades, I'm gonna be doing something like that. And somebody else think, oh my God, that sounds terrific. My son is an adrenaline junkie. He would be one of the first ones on that and having a ball. And the more he fell off, the more fun he would have with it. Not my cup of tea. Everything in life is energy. Just look at this picture. It causes you to respond in some way. Somebody is going to look at this picture and say, oh, my God, I hate babies. They are always crying. They're a pain in the butt. Thank God I don't have any or thank God they're grown. Somebody else is going to respond to this picture and say, oh, how adorable. That response or reaction, depending on you, impacts how you feel in your body because everything in our life is about energy. Everything is about how we respond or don't to all the stimuli around us. And we've got so much stimuli around us constantly that really impacts what we do. So notice what emotions come up when you see this. Sadness because your babies are grown. Joy that your babies are grown. What feelings show up? What thoughts? And it also goes back to body memory. Body memory is something that is absolutely amazing. To me, that is the secret of the secret of so much of our lives. Because every experience you've had from the moment of conception is in your body. Every single experience from the moment of conception is in your body. So that there is nothing you have forgotten. We used to believe that it all existed in your head. But we now know, it's absolutely fascinating, that um, if you've ever studied the world of transplants, that when we transplant an organ from one individual into another, they literally take in your memories. There is a wonderful book out, it is a change of heart. It's written about a ballerina who this was back, I just maybe 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. It was a ballerina who had the first heart lung transplant in Boston. And she was a very delicate thing, very high end, travel constantly, dancing around the world, staying at five star resorts. What ends up happening is that she was born with a lung disorder and a heart disorder. And eventually in her 50s needed to have a heart lung transplant. When she did this, she went into surgery slightly frightened as anybody would be. But when she recovered, she started having dreams of running down a football field as if she was actually running down the field excited about a touchdown. She also started craving chicken McNuggets and burgers. And her friends told her she was traumatized because of the surgery and they should go into therapy. So she went into therapy for a while and then realized she did not have an emotional issue. She had these memories. And so what she ended up doing to make a long story short, it's a wonderful story. So what she ended up doing was researching who had died within two days of her transplant. And she narrowed it down, went to upstate Maine and found out that an 18 year old boy had graduated from high school. Three of his friends were saving to go backpacking through Europe. And this boy was a football star in high school. He was 19 years old, had been a football star in high school and was on his way home from work on his, on his motorcycle. He was working two jobs on his way home from work with a box of chicken McNuggets in his leather jacket on his motorcycle. Coming home, he was saving all of his money to take off in this backpacking trip through Europe with his friends. And he was killed. She contacted the family. Chicken McNuggets was his favorite food. And here she was craving chicken McNuggets. In addition to that, what was happening, excuse me, I let somebody in and this whole thing just went and did its thing. Um, chicken McNuggets was his favorite food. He had been a football player. His life went and kept shifting 
And as his life changed and he got new appetites for food as well as excitement, that's what she was experiencing. She was not having a hard time adjusting to the transplant. She was dealing with things that were absolutely out of her worldview that now became her way of life. And notice this, the body memory that existed for him became her body memories. So in transplants, she needed to assimilate his experiences. She needed to assimilate his tastes because they were now impacting how she walked through the world. Most of us have had blood transfusions if you've been hospitalized. That's a very small dosage. When you get something as big as an organ, you get the cellular memory. So let's start with the first personality style. Again, if you would mute, unless you have a question, if you would mute. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, the first style, and this happens at the point of birth. This is created. The creative intellectual or the thought leader. You've seen little babies walk around on their tiptoes. They're not fully planted when they walk. These little ones, this is the personality style they will be developing. These folks are very creative. They are the thought leaders. Every company needs it. They are the ones that come up. They can take your company to the next level. They have great ideas, great thoughts. They are the catalysts. Amazingly, they are very sensitive, extremely perceptive, very spiritual people and frequently psychic, brilliant, innovative thinkers. I had a girlfriend, Marilyn, in Hartford, and somebody had said to Marilyn, Marilyn, we need some blankets for the, um, the homeless, winter's coming. And you think you could ask some friends if they have extra blankets. Marilyn being Marilyn, she's such a creative soul. She didn't contact her friends. She contacted three different companies in the country that made blankets and asked if they had any seconds that they were going to be throwing away. Marilyn got truckloads of blankets in. Now, once the blankets came in, she wanted nothing to do with anything. She was a creative catalyst, but wanted nothing to do with implementation. So think about this. How many of us are really great at coming up with great ideas? real great thought leaders, but these are the inventors or can be the inventors that continuously have lots of creative ideas, but never really get to implement it. They're creative, but implementation is something completely different. So look at this, when they are healthy, they are absolutely in the creative mode. They're coming up with great ideas, things work and they are filled with passion. However, when this personality style goes into fear, the way their fear manifests is they begin to see the world as a dangerous place. The world certainly has dangers in it, but is it really a dangerous place? Or is that simply danger is there and we learn how to live with the dangers around us? Because in addition, there is so much exquisite beauty around us. I am safe if I am invisible. So how many try to stay invisible because of the difficulty that if I, if I become too visible, if I speak too much, somebody could destroy me. They also have a feeling of I don't belong here and they feel trapped. Notice if you've ever noticed, said to yourself, I feel trapped. If you do, this is it. If before you started today, this talk tonight, you took that leadership self-assessment tool, you would have noticed I said there are five that I'm going to go over. Normally, most of us have one or two of these that are really pronounced in our personality and then in our leadership style. If this is one of yours, notice that this is it. So when you are feeling trapped, you really are going into fear and vulnerability. And this is the personality style that's up for you. This is a leadership style so that it becomes frightening to implement change in your business. It comes, it, you feel as if you don't belong. I made a mistake. I shouldn't have opened up this business or I shouldn't have ended and entered this industry because you realize you don't belong here, which is a lie, but it's a message we tell ourselves. For this particular personality style, and if you don't know if this is you, take a look at these common illnesses and see if these happen frequently to you. If they do, 
then this is what you're looking at. Bone disorders, knees and joints. This is the personality that, and I'm sure we can say it with a sense of humor, nobody's home. Have you ever found out that you get in a shower in the evening and find this huge black and blue mark on you? And if that happens, you get in the shower, there's this huge black and blue mark on you. What ended up happening is that you walked into something during the day, but because you weren't even present, you didn't even notice it. Now that you see it in the shower, you're in great pain because all of a sudden, here you go. Sciatica. In the extreme, they can become hypochondriacs. Emotionally, anxiety and panic disorders become a real issue for these individuals. ADHD to the extreme. So that notice that they are very creative and spiritual, but when they are in fear, they go to these other limitations I showed you and it presents in these illnesses. So if you don't know what your style is, if this is something that you're much more prone to, here we go. Second personality style is the empathic. When they are healthy, they are immensely empathic. When they go into fear, they become very oral. You know those people you're with 10 minutes and they've sucked you dry. We all know them, all right? This is where they go when they're in fear. When they are healthy, they're very interested in helping other people. They are the team leaders. They are the folks in your organization that recognize everybody's strengths and limitations. They recognize that the, the weak link, if you will, in the organization still has great strengths. And they create a team where everybody compensates for everybody else's weaknesses and reinforces everybody's strengths. These are amazing team leaders because they are so empathic and sensitive to their team. They create a united front rather than separate individuals. And they are really interested in helping others. They recognize others' needs. Oftentimes these folks become social workers or work in ministry. They're easy to trust and very unthreatening and they relate easily to other people. This is what makes them so fantastic as a team leader. What happens, however, when they go to fear is they can't get enough. There is a belief system that there's not enough, there's not enough time, there's not enough food, there's not enough money. There's not enough becomes a belief system they have spiritually. And so energetically, there's a feeling of depletion which is why they can suck you dry. There's a feeling of absolute depletion and there's a belief that their needs will never be met because there isn't the realization that they have more than the ability they need to meet every need they've got. And if they can't do it personally, they know how to reach out and ask for help. Conversely, many of us never ask for help because we have a belief that we're supposed to do it all on our own. There's the same imbalance here, but it just shows up differently because of a belief that you should be able to do everything on your own. And there isn't a one of us on this planet that can do everything alone. There's also a great sense of entitlement. The world owes me. It doesn't. The world doesn't owe us anything. Notice the common illnesses that take place here. Common illnesses that take place are addictions. This is where the addictive personality comes in. Again, that belief that there's not enough. Whether we're talking food, we're talking sex, we're talking drugs or alcohol, whatever it may be, addictions become part of this personality. Because of that, because of that inability to reconnect with that passion, that power and that purpose to go out and make things happen, they're more prone to wait for people to bring things to them. You've seen some of these folks at parties where they sit down and somebody say, can I get you something to drink? I'm getting something for myself. Sure. Somebody else says, I'm getting something to eat. Would you like some? Sure. And people are waiting on them while they sit there feeling that nobody ever is there to fill their needs because they don't know how to see that their needs are being met because of a spiritual belief that says, my needs will never be met. Even if it happens to them, they don't recognize it. And their belief remains that nobody is there for me. And they become much more passive in their own life, which weakens passivity, weakens immune function. Passivity helps support low immune function. With that, there's also that belief that there's not enough sweetness in life. There comes diabetes. 
diabetes is the inability to, to truly process the sweetness of life, the inability to assimilate the sweetness of life and release the excess and move on. Obesity, again, common, the addictions. Obesity is simply an addiction to food because it's one way to believe our needs are being met, even if it's more self-destructive, as is anorexia and bulimia. Again, the, the ability either way to anorexia, I don't deserve to have my needs met. Bulimia, I am going to meet them and then feel guilty enough and not be able to sustain that. And they eliminate the ability to have their needs met. So either one is destructive. I will never get my needs met, so therefore I don't even ask. Or I demand and take in a way that becomes self-destructive. So just notice for yourself, before you're judging everybody in your family, before you're judging your partners and your kids and your friends and your brothers and sisters, recognize this isn't to use things against others. It's to support you in understanding yourself and also understanding how you function or don't in the world. The third style of leadership is a supportive leader. The third, same third style of personality is when they are healthy, they are the absolute nurturer. There are people that in our lives we've all been blessed with that are absolutely reliable. They are the hard workers. They are loyal. They are persevering and they're capable of great love. These are the folks in, in the business world, whether in corporate or in a small to medium sized business who don't have any desire to be CEO or COO it has nothing to do with lack of motivation or lack of drive. They are fed emotionally and spiritually because of their ability to support the leader. They are fed emotionally and spiritually and they love who they are in their ability to love, in their ability to support others rising. And this individual, because they are so committed, because they are so loyal, that when you are working hard when you are out there making things happen, they've got your back. What a gift to know somebody has your back. What an exquisite gift to know somebody has your back and is there for you. And this is that individual who does that, who supports you. However, when they go into fear for whatever reason, there is a belief that the more they suffer, the more I suffer, the more people will like me. Have you noticed some people do great things and then they talk about it for six weeks. For six weeks, they throw in your face what they've done to you. And it's like the more difficult it was for me to do that, the more I think you'll appreciate what I did. The more you see how much I suffered, the more you'll recognize what a wonderful person I am. And I'm not even saying this is conscious. Most So much of what we do, sadly, is not conscious. Part of what I would love to do, part of why I'm doing this, is to support you in recognizing consciously what is your style. Because if you can recognize your style, you can begin to heal. There is also a belief that I must never be angry in this personality style. I must never be angry or make others uncomfortable. So what can end up happening? Okay, quiet that down. Okay, Chuck. Jane, could you mute yourself, please? All right, there we go. So what can end up happening here is autoimmune disorders. Autoimmune disorders, people who don't know what to do with their anger or their rage, and so they turn it on themselves. It is better to be enraged at me than to be enraged at somebody else. So notice what takes place always at the point of onset of a disorder or a disease. What is taking place? When you can recognize that, you can begin to deal with how could I in a healthy way be angry here and learn healthy ways of dealing with anger and not be frightened. Anger, most of the time, people confuse confrontation with conflict. And if you can recognize that confrontation is dealing with the problem, you're not attacking an individual, you're confronting a problem to find a solution. That's dramatically different than creating conflict. 
And for this personality who is such a loving, giving soul, that fear of being angry because they could make somebody else uncomfortable causes them to hold all of this anger inside and not find a solution to the difficulty. If you notice many couples, and this happens in business as well, there's a problem and they don't talk about it. The issue never goes away. They continuously just don't talk about it. So there is no resolution. And I've heard people, you know, back in the day when I was seeing 42 patients a week as a therapist, and I would hear people say, this is the same problem we have had for the past 15 years. Well, if this is a problem you've had for the past 15 years, it's because you never dealt with the problem. And if you never dealt with the problem, it's because there was a fear there was a fear around being angry. So look, looking at that and looking at the illusionary belief that I wish I could, but I can't. We're back into, if you believe you can't, you're correct. If you believe you can, you're correct. What I say frequently is never waste your time fighting somebody or something that says you can't. Don't put an ounce of energy into combating somebody who says you can't. Walk around them and keep on going. It's a waste of time to convince somebody of something they don't believe. If my experience is that if you're a dreamer and you've got great goals, the only people that are gonna tell you it's impossible are the people who have never went after their own dreams. If you have dreams and you have visions, only turn to folks who have followed their dreams. They are the only ones that have the ability to support you in achieving it. Because if somebody has been terrified of going after their own dreams, they have no ability to support you in going after yours because they don't believe in theirs. They're not going to believe in yours. Another one of the situations that can show up for somebody like this and this personality style, this leadership style, is I am powerless. There isn't one of us on this planet who is powerless. There are many of us who don't own our power because we come from a family where we had a parent who didn't know how to do power, but they knew how to do control. And so we came to believe that that angry controlling parent was powerful when in truth, angry controlling people are in fear. Powerful people have absolutely no desire to control. Powerful people are so busy living their visions, they don't want the responsibility of controlling others because it is so limiting and destructive. The common illnesses somebody with this personality style develop are digestive and eating disorders. Frequently, you'll find that what they end up doing is these folks end up eating while they're standing at the table. They eat on the run. They don't even take time to sit down and eat, even for 10, 15 minutes, just sitting down and taking care of themselves. Self-care is something they feel very guilty about. So they don't do a lot of self-care because they're busy supporting other people. Now, again, this is only when they're in fear. So the digestive and eating disorders come about because they literally are throwing down food, usually that isn't good for them, because they don't take the time to do the self-care required. They develop ulcers because they are filled with so much anxiety around their inability to handle so much that they're taking on. Liver problems. Liver is liver problems reflect an illusion of victimization and all of the emotions that go around that, all the frustration, all of the anger around victimization. It's not coincidental, aging myself a little bit, but back in the day when hepatitis C showed up, it showed up in the liver disorder during the time of Vietnam. We lost Bobby. Kennedy, we lost John, we lost Martin Luther King. We had so many important people killed in a short period of time and our country lost a war, which theoretically we were never supposed to lose. And the country became a victim to all the violence that was really impacting us as a people, as a country. 
that was theoretically the best in the world, and yet all of this was happening. And hepatitis C became a huge issue in our country. So take a look at how this happens. Breast cancer. There's a big difference between breast cancer, left breast cancer, and right breast cancer. And we're back into self-care. The right side of our body is around our belief systems. It's in I right breast cancer, I don't believe I have the right to take care of myself. In a Judeo-Christian culture, we're taught that is selfish. We should always be thinking of others. So there is a belief system that it is selfish of me to take the time to do self-care. Now, this is a belief system, not a fact. Left breast cancer, I believe I have the right to take care of myself, but only after everybody else's needs are met. But when you are somebody who believes you are loved because of what you do, not because of who you are, you're continuously doing for everybody else. So you're doing that for coworkers, you're doing that for your family, you're doing that for your partner, you're doing that for your children. You teach people to be dependent upon you so that you never have everybody's needs all met because there are too many people in your life who need, which therefore means you never get permission to do self-care and you pay a price. We then also have chronic fatigue. I worked with a young girl who developed chronic fatigue. It was amazing. She was brought into my office by this um, young, handsome young man. She came in in a walker and came in to see me. And I, at that time of my practice, my private practice, I was doing a half hour of therapy and then a half hour of people on the table doing energy work. And she came in to see me and I asked what was going on. And she said, chronic fatigue. I asked what happened when it began. She never thought about it. She said, I never, I never even thought about it. I said, well, let's take a few minutes and think about it. What happened when she developed chronic fatigue was she was the first person in her family to ever go to college. Her parents came in from Italy. She was the first person to ever go to college in her family. And they told her that good girls become teachers. And so therefore she went to college to become a teacher. And she went through school, did great. She studied well, got into the classroom and recognized she hated teaching in the classroom, hated it. By the time Christmas came, the end of this first semester, she was working in elementary school. She was so unhappy, she was becoming physically ill. When it was time to go back in January, she didn't know if she could get out of bed. But she went back for about two weeks and finally was sent home. She couldn't work. She was diagnosed with chronic fatigue, stayed in bed, or her parents would help her out into the living room and she would sit on a chair. She went from a cane to a walker. And she had been engaged to be married, but the doctor told her if she had children, it could kill her. So she broke off the engagement with her fiance, who was actually the young man that brought her into my office in the first place. And I said, if you broke up with him. Why is he being so loving to bring you here? And she said, he won't go away. He believes that we're meant to be together. And so as I worked with her and looked at the fact that her chronic fatigue was she was exhausted living a life she did not want to live. She had been at home and to the point of a walker about a year by the time she came to see me. While we were working, I had a vision of her working in a playground with a fence around it with a bunch of young children. And I asked her if she'd ever thought of working in a playground, teaching kids sports. And she said, that's the kind of teaching she would love, but not in a classroom. So I asked if she had a boys club, a girls club, or some kind of community place near where she lived. And two blocks away, there was a girls club. She went there and I said, why don't you go and see if you can volunteer half time, two days a week. So she went to volunteer two half days, loved it, came so alive working with these kids doing arts and crafts and teaching them different things, which she couldn't participate in because she was still so tired, but started getting progressively better. After just a few months time, she was working there two full days, volunteering, but working there two full days. Within three more months, she no longer needed her walker. She no longer needed her cane. She was walking and they offered her a full-time position doing phys ed with these kids. 
And she was so happy. Her physical health came back. Her strength came back because she was walking more. So the strength in her legs and her muscles came back. And she ended up getting married. And the last time I saw her, she was pregnant with her second child. She was no longer chronically tired of her life. She loved her life. She was having a ball in her life and she had her children. So it's so important for us to take a look at what is going on with us, again, spiritually, that she needed to be a good girl. She owed her parents because they put her through college and they were good people. They just did what they thought was best for her, but how that impacted her emotionally then impacted her physically. And persistent fatigue, if you were constantly exhausted, what is going on in your life? The fourth leader is the, the visionary leader. This is the leader when they are healthy, they're a leader. When they're unhealthy, they are a controller. Good leaders, they're the visionary ones. You have the thought leader who comes up with ideas for a company. They may even found the company. Then a team leader who helps whether you're working with virtual assistants or employees. The team leader who creates a, a culture, works with the, the, the founder of the company, creates a culture for this company and creates a team to support the CEO making it happen. And then you have the, the supportive leader who's ready to really have the back of that person who becomes the real leader in the company. And it isn't always the founder. The founder could be the thought leader, but the one who takes the business out into the world is somebody with a very different personality. This is the visionary leader. They are phenomenal leaders. Now, there's a great difference between a leader and a manager. A manager simply manages the system a leader leads you down to the next level. A leader takes you to a place you haven't been yet. These folks are powerful speakers. They're very charismatic. They tend to be very generous when they are in the truth of who they are. They are very entertaining and charming. They can be very cool under fire. And we need this because when things... I share with somebody today, I always told my kids, we have big problems and little problems. We don't do crises and we don't do drama. Little problems and big problems, which ones are they? Those are the leaders. They support people dealing and going. They are cool under fire because it's only a problem. Let's figure out what we need to do and every problem has a solution. This is healthy, effective leadership, making it happen. When they are not in a healthy place, and notice if this is you, they need to be right. These people are never wrong. It's not acceptable to be wrong. They want lots of power in a relationship or in a business, but none of the responsibility. If anything goes wrong, it is not their fault. If anything goes wrong, they want to find out who did it so that they have somebody else to blame. These are also the folks that you meet in your life because they need to be in control. When they're in fear, they either come from manip manipulation, intimidation, or absolute control. So notice that they are manipulating. And if manipulation doesn't work, they will do seduction. If seduction doesn't work, they will intimidate. Some people start out with intimidation, then go to seduction and manipulation, but it always goes between these three, manipulation, intimidation, or seduction. Any way they can get control, they will do it. They have a belief system basically that says, don't get close to me unless you look up to me. So in relationship, there are some real issues here because they need to be adored in their relationships. They don't look for partners because that's too intimidating. They need to be in control. So they tend to be in control with people who are masochists when it comes to personal relationships. They tend to be the one that needs to be right, never wrong. They want all the power, but not responsibility. The masochist, the, the supportive leader tends to take on all the responsibilities. So they tend to come together and they have a belief that they don't need anybody yet they are the first ones to turn on you if you are not there for them when they need you. Now notice this is only when they are in fear. So notice if all of these things I've, I've gone over here and we're just about done and then I wanna do Q and A, but notice that every one of us, welcome to humanity, every one of us goes into fear. 
How long we stay there is up to us. How we do that is up to us. So just notice what are the common illnesses that take place here? These folks develop benign essential tremors. This is when your hand just shakes, perhaps one or two hands shake because they are holding in so much, holding in so much anger, so much fear about control. They can develop gallbladder disorders. Many people have the gallbladder removed either because they don't allow themselves to ever get angry or they are always angry. We know those folks we've dealt with. They're really angry about this. You resolve that problem in 10 minutes. They're angry about something else. We resolve that problem. They're angry about something else. The only way they feel impassioned and powerful is in their anger. So when you take their anger away, they feel powerless. So they have to become angry about something else. I worked with a couple once in marriage therapy, and she said to me, we've been married 23 years, and I have never once been mad at my husband. I thought, oh, my God, if you've been married 23 years and you've never been mad at your husband, there's something somebody's in denial of. I don't care how wonderful he is. Welcome to humanity. So really, it's, it's taking a look of what goes on. If you've never been mad in 23 years of marriage, what is wrong with experiencing it? Awesome. And again, if you think anger makes you bad, you don't experience your anger. But if anger simply means I have, a, I have a, an issue that bothers me, deal with it. If you walked in your front door and you walked into a chair, the first time you did that, you would be mad. You'd be mad at yourself and mad at the chair. How, how stupid can I be? And then you're mad at the chair. The second time you walk in and you walk into the chair, you want to throw the chair out the window. By the third time you walk in and stub your toe in that chair, you want to move. If you listened the first time and you acknowledged you were angry, you stubbed your toe and it hurt, and it, I have a problem here, I'm angry, it means I have a problem, how can I solve it? You'd move the chair, whether it means decorating the, redecorating the entire room or simply moving the chair, you would deal with the problem and you would never be angry again when you walked in the front door. You have a problem, you get angry, you solve it. Notice that fibromyalgia. I received um, fifty thousand dollars from NIH, National Institutes of Health grant, at one point to research my work in fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is very much this personality style. Fibromyalgia is a disorder of the bladder meridian, which is an energy flows within the body, and the bladder meridian starts here at the forehead, it goes down the back along the spinal column, out to the hips, and down the legs. And when the doctors initially confused this with rheumatoid arthritis, finally dealt with this and um, diagnosed it at 18 points. If you have these 18 points that are very acute in pain, you're diagnosed with fibromyalgia. This piece here, fibromyalgia, the spiritual and emotional causes of that, spiritually, there is a belief system that I have no purpose in my life. My sole purpose is in my ability to love and protect the people in my world. And if you believe that your ability is to love and protect the people in your world, what happens when the people in your world move away? The very first patient I met who had fibromyalgia came in, a beautiful Irish woman, her daughters were six feet tall, blonde hair, blue eyes, girls, and her oldest wanted to go to Japan to do junior year abroad. The mother was terrified because she said, what if my daughter is so much taller than everybody there? She sticks out in a crowd. What if people don't like her? What if they abuse her? What if she doesn't like the food? What if she doesn't make any friends? What if she doesn't like her courses? What, what, what? And all the fear and anxiety was building up along her back. And again, radiates out so her entire body. She was becoming paralyzed. She could barely move without acute pain. When I could work with her to reframe, what does it mean to love? Your daughter chose Japan. She could have chose any country in the world. She wants to go to Japan. What if you simply supported her? And what if she learned how to make friends in a different culture? She would feel so empowered. She would know she could go anywhere and be okay. What if she learned to like food she's never had in her life? What if she had an amazing experience that changed her view of the world? 
If we don't allow our children to go out and fall on their face, make a mistake and deal, we don't teach them they can get up and be okay. We keep them dependent on us. And also in fibromyalgia, my first question was, if nobody needed you and you did not need to protect everybody in the world, you would be left with yourself, which means you would now have to deal with who do you want to be and how do you want to do your life? And for some people, that is terrifying. These people, if you can think of them also as the folks that huff and puff and blow your house down, all their energy is held from the chest up. Heart attacks and heart disease is heart issues are always related to relationships. Heart attacks, there is something dramatic that just took place in your relationship that has thrown you for loop and your heart cannot handle the stress, the rejection, whatever the pain may be. Heart disease is a slow developing issue in your relationships that's not being dealt with that eventually develops into heart disease. Strokes, because the energy is held all up here. Migraine headaches. I can tell you that in migraine headaches, and this is strokes, it's all in the brain. Migraine headaches, uh, people come in and think of that you're five feet, five inches, five feet, six inches tall. Energy flows throughout your entire body. You try to keep everything in your head with the belief that you can think through things. You're bringing all this energy that needs to be around your whole body up into your head. When folks who come in and see me in my office and say, I've got a migraine, I'd say, lay on the table. I'm going to touch your toes. I want you to stop thinking, just feel your toes under my fingers. Feel your toes under my fingers. Feel what it feels like as I go up and down your toes. Just don't think about it. Just feel your toes as I go up and down your toes. And they'd say to me, my God, it's a miracle. The headache is going away. What happened is I'm bringing the energy down through your body, down to your toes, out of your head. So your head isn't trying to encompass and overthink everything. And the migraine goes away so quickly. Prostate disorders. This happens as well in this particular personality. When you need to be in control and a man feels emasculated, some men lose their jobs and they feel elated. They're frightened they don't have a job, but they hated the job and they finally got permission to leave it. Other men, when they are released from their positions, are enraged because the company took away their manhood, took away their ability to provide for their families. And instead of going into fear or going into a sense of freedom, now I can find a job perhaps in a company I like or a job I like. Go into rage. I've worked with clients. At the same time, one man was let go, went home and told his wife he was delighted. He never would have quit in good conscience, but is thrilled he was gone. And he said, we have to change our lifestyle, but I am going to be so much freer. His cholesterol came down, his blood pressure came down, and his sex drive went up. Now the man went through the same experience, and what ended up happening is that he was so enraged and enraged and enraged, started drinking more, his wife had to get a job, his enlarged prostate developed into prostate cancer. How we deal with our emotions impacts what happens to our body. Finally, as we go through all of this here, let's go into the last one, the achiever, rigid, the organizational leader. You know, some of those leaders that love to be in a room all by themselves, they're excited when you create a new project because they can create procedures and protocols. They love creating procedures and protocols. They love creating order. It fills them with great delight. These folks here, organizational leaders, they are very successful, high energy, fast worker, they get things done. They are well liked because they don't work against anybody. However, when they go into fear, they believe they have to work and produce in order to be okay. If they are not productive, you won't respect or like them. So they always find something to do. There are folks, some folks who have an extreme inability to sit down, others who can't wait to sit down. But these folks can't sit down, they have to be doing something because that's what makes them good enough. And for them, good enough is not good enough. They've got to be the best in order to be acceptable. So know if you do this to yourself, because if you need to be the best at everything, you are putting in a um, ridiculous and outrageous amount of energy and panic and stress on your own bodies. The illnesses these folks develop truly are disorders of the heart, the lungs, and the thymus. 
because they need to keep moving, they can't deal with their own humanity. But again, remember I said earlier, an ability to deal with life and all of its changes. Welcome to humanity. We all have failings. None of us are the best at everything. So that inability to deal with that impacts the lungs. And therefore, they are not worthy, which impacts their ability to be in relationship with themselves, which is the heart. And think of folks like that. They hold themselves so tight, so rigid, that constipation literally becomes a problem. Their body isn't able to function organically. Their body is held so rigidly, they can't function and constipation becomes an issue which is thus the pulmonary disorder. Circulation doesn't impact. When you hold your body so tight, I've had somebody come and see me and their, their shoulders are up to their ears. And when I helped them relax a little bit and it dropped down about an inch, they thought they were completely relaxed. And I said, you've got about three more inches to go. They couldn't fathom being so relaxed that their body was at peace. And it's when your body is at peace that circulation works, that your organs work, that your functions work. When you are at peace, you are happy with who you are, with all the strengths and limitations you possess. We've all got unlimited strengths. We all have an amazing number of limitations. All that does is make us human. It doesn't make us not good enough. It makes us human. So when you are happy with who you are and you realize you are the gift you bring to the world, Everything else is detail. Everything else is detail. Recognize who you are in all of your strengths, in all of your limitations. And when you can do that, you begin to see that coming back into humanity is the gift you give yourself. We are all human and we are never going to be more than human. We are embodied souls. We are embodied goodness. And I think as human beings, and I say this as a therapist and a coach, we're an exquisite creatures. But we don't appreciate it unless we accept the honesty of our humanity. I would like to stop talking. Are there any questions anybody has? Please feel free. Lynn? Yes, yes. how are you? Nice to see you. Uh, you know, I have everything on the list that I think I'm going to die tomorrow. <laughs> <I'm just saying. laughs> I'm in trouble anyway. But, you know, <laughs> as you were talking, I was thinking about my father in particular and his heart condition and things like that. But also he had asthma and I was thinking about that. And it just made me wonder, like, how much of, uh, you know, her, you're talking about the heart transplant and that staying in you. And I just can't help but wonder what heredity and the, um, you know, the energy of past of uh, our genetics coming through us. Has Genetic to is a, genetics is a predisposition land. It's not, but it never needs to be actualized. Think about this for a moment. If both your parents are diabetic and they have five children, all five kids should be diabetics if it's simply genetics. And yet, if you look at these families statistically, out of those five kids, two of them may have diabetes and the other three don't. So what's the variable and why these two created it? The, in, I don't mean chose to, but it was developed in their body and it didn't for the other three. If you look at the variable, if you walk into the home of the two that have diabetes, it is probably decorated the way their mother's was. They are living the lifestyle of their parents. They're eating the way their parents ate. They have the same political, religious worldview as their parents. Look at the three that don't have diabetes. They are living a very different lifestyle. They probably have very different political and spiritual beliefs than their parents. They have a very different approach to life than their parents. So they've all got this genetic predisposition, yet it didn't get actualized. What were you noticing as well right now that if you look at the stats on breast cancer on prostate cancer and all of these things, nowhere in the family history are there any of these diseases. It's because the stresses are being carried so dramatically differently now that these diseases are becoming much more rampant. You know, and genetics is just a predisposition, but don't actualize it. But again, never ever blaming the victim. We're all human and it presents uniquely for every one of us. 
But my feeling is if it presents, how can I help you minimize it? How can I help remove that from you? It can happen. So did the woman get the chicken nuggets out of her head? <laughs> what, she, what, she, what she did is was she read, she in speaking to the parents, she got to know so much about this boy that she really fell in love with him. It was just so grateful for the gift of life he gave her. Yeah. That when those things came up, when she saw herself running down the football field, she would just laugh because there's no way in Haiti she would be capable of doing such a thing. But she could see that the gift of life he gave her was he gave her some of his youthful exuberance. He gave her some of his own passion mm -hmm. and she lovingly embraced it. Bernie Siegel did a number with this years ago in research. What happens when people are rejecting organs? What is that about? You know, mm -hmm. what, why does that happen? Um, is there issues around racism, around ethnicity? What, what are the issues in, in, in doing that? And again, not everything is conscious. My desire is to bring people into consciousness because if you can be conscious of how does my body feel when it's stressed? Because if you live like this, you don't know how it feels like it's stressed because this is normal. But if you learn that this is stress-free and, and they used to do back in the, in the days in therapy, we would teach people, hold your hands really, really tight. Now let go. Hold them really, really tight. Now let go. So what ends up happening is during the course of the day, you feel yourself really, really tight. You almost instantaneously let go because you practice this for five minutes in the morning and perhaps five minutes in the evening. So now when you get like this, you know automatically to release. So you're teaching yourself to be conscious of what it feels like to be stressed and what it feels like to be peaceful. And that small, simple thing, we don't have to do these major changes. That small, simple thing can truly impact how you hold stress in your body or don't which impacts your health physically, which allows you to be more peaceful, therefore less depressed and less anxious, and allows you to begin to see in the world that if you could make this change in your life, how many other changes could you make in your life? So now your view of the world and your place in it changes. And you begin to recognize if I could accomplish this, who knows what's next? Who knows what's next? And you begin to realize nothing is impossible. I mean, I, I, I truly believe that I am, I am a kid who grew up in an orphanage and I was adopted and raised in the housing projects of the inner city. And if you made it out of high school, you're a success story. And I couldn't go to nursing school because I went to an unaccredited inner city school. So no nursing school in the country would let me in. And yet I ended up years later with a PhD teaching at UConn Medical. So anything is possible if you believe it is, and it's impossible if you believe it is. So why not change your perspective and open up the world? Are there any other questions? Yeah, Susan? Um, do you have any insights on um, chronic Lyme disease? Yeah, Lyme disease is about being invaded. Okay. You have something very small invaded your body. So in what way are you feeling invaded? In what way are your boundaries, if it's your boundaries, in what way? It could be others, it could be you. And where, where does this invasion take place in your life? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, hon. Hi, Ariana. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> My little one. <laughs> Hi, I have a question about dementia. Yeah. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about that. Um, Certainly. Especially for those of us who are a bit worried about seeing a pattern coming through the generations and well, again, we don't want yeah. to be part of um, afraid of that. that right. You know, and notice what, happens when, a, notice what happens when you're frightened of something. Don't you tend to bring it in? It doesn't matter what it is. I'm frightened I'm going to fall. I'm frightened I'm going to fall. Guess what? There you go you're down in the ground. You know, when we're frightened of things, we bring them in. Dementia is, is look at, one of the things we have discovered is that people with dementia who lose awareness of, of short-term and then long-term memory, they often keep long-term. They lose short-term and it then goes progressively down and it comes and goes. But you have even people with dementia, you put on music, 
from their generation, whether that's the 30s or the 40s, whatever age may be for them, they're able to stand up and dance and sing those songs. You shut the music off and they go back to being physically and emotionally limited. So what happens when they go back to those songs of the past, they go back to joy. They go back to things that they experienced that made them light, made them free. There's wonderful things they're doing with dance in homes and Alzheimer's units and dementia units, because not all dementia is Alzheimer's, that they are doing in these units and bringing joy to these people. So it takes a look at what part of the world do they no longer want to see? What part of the world do they no longer see? How many of us know people who, some people are old at 50. I mean, I've seen people in their 50s who look like they're close to death. Life is old. And I've seen people in their 80s and 90s who are just so filled with life, it's, it's going to be around forever. All right. So notice what happens when you've got people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, who every morning, the first thing they do is wake up and look at obituaries. Look at who they've lost. Look at who has died. Look at who is seriously ill and may die. How many of them will say to you, I don't know that I want to go on. Everybody I know is dead. I didn't know that I want to go on. I'm just waiting to die. And yet what they have found is some nursing homes, when they bring toddlers in, when they bring young school, young elementary school children in, the folks are becoming healthier. The folks are moving into a better place because they've got this youth, they've got this energy, and they've got these animals they're bringing in. Some are bringing in dogs. And all of a sudden, youth, this vibrancy, this energy coming in, and their health emotionally, spiritually, and physically is improving. So we've got to look at how we're doing it. It's amazing. It's amazing what we're learning and seeing. Yes. If I might, um, what about PCOS? Like what about your um, polycystic ovarian syndrome? Well, when we look at the ovaries, ovaries are really about our ability to give life. So in what ways are you giving life? In what ways are you bringing life to others, to yourself and to others? And so when we look at that endometriosis, any of these types of things, what are we dealing with when it comes to our reproductive system? In what way are we being productive? And what do we believe we are supposed to be doing? This takes me to, to the situation where I worked with one girl who, and I know it's time I, we, I said we would end at seven. If you need to go, go, please. If you wanna stay, I'm more than willing to answer questions. Um, I worked with a young girl. She was in her early thirties, so my bias here, a young girl in her early thirties. And she had, um, she had had this point in, and when she came in to see me, five miscarriages. And one somewhere at three months, somewhere at six months and whatever, the babies never lived. And it's amazing to me, simple questions people never think of asking. And I said to her, do you remember when these miscarriages took place? She said, I never thought about it, which is pretty much a standard response I get from people. I never thought about it. Well, let's take a minute and think about it. As she took a minute to think about it, she said, my God, every one of them took place in February around Valentine's Day. I never thought about that. And I said, so let's talk about Valentine's Day. What importance does that have in your life? She said to me, when I was five years old, my parents decided to go out for Valentine's Day and they had my uncle come in to babysit. And at five years of age, my uncle started raping me. And I was raped from five until nine because he's the one that always volunteered for my parents to go out and he would babysit. And every single child she carried aborted on Valentine's Day. She had never, ever made the connection. And so she and her husband came in. I did a few sessions with them as a couple. And then I did energy work with her 
in therapy, again, I was doing, as I said, a half hour therapy, a half hour energy work at that point in my career. And she got pregnant, never had trouble getting pregnant. She got pregnant again with her husband. And she said, we would be happy with just one baby, just one baby, we would be so happy. He had a large Jamaican family and, and they just wanted to bring all of this in. So she got pregnant and saw me every week for the next nine months. And I did energy work to strengthen her cervix. I did energy work to work through Valentine's Day, to work through the trauma that this uncle may not be raping her anymore, but he was still controlling her life and her body the way he had when she was five. So I was supporting her taking control of her body away from her uncle and back to her that she and her husband now could work together to cherish this exquisite body. And so as we did that, we, I worked with her weekly, strengthening the cervix energetically, which you can do if you understand energy work. I could do that for her, but also emotionally supporting her and taking her life back from her uncle. I mean, she was successful professionally. It's just personally and in terms of her own physical body and her pregnancies where she had difficulty. And we took her back and at nine months, she gave birth to a beautiful baby boy who was such a cherished child, all right? After that, she didn't care if she had um, a hysterectomy. She didn't care what happened. She had her baby and they were both delighted. And I can assure you this child was treasured every day of his life, all right? So we have to look at what is going on in her body. And again, what's happening emotionally? What's happening spiritually? And as with many incest survivors, whether they are 18 months old or 12 years old, this belief that somehow I caused it, somehow it was my fault. I said or did something that make this okay. When that's not the case. It's, it's quite an adventure healing work. It's quite an adventure claiming our lives. But if we can claim them, we don't end up with physical disease. And, and I hope I've showed you tonight how this truly works. That, I mean, I, I could talk for hours. I mean, I had a four year program that I taught for 19 years. So clearly I could talk for four years about this work, but I won't do that to you. But, but do know that when we look at the energy we put out that life's a struggle and I'm exhausted. You're creating certain emotional beliefs that will be impacting you physically. Mm -hmm. When we put out other beliefs that this is an adventure and I am gonna have ups and downs, I am going to have some disorders, some diseases. I may have accidents. I broke my leg once when I was in the midst of selling my home. I was going to a friend's um, wedding reception and fell down and broke my leg. And my first thought was, what on earth is this about? Because that's always my question, what is this about? And when I looked at what this was about, is at that point in time, I had been divorced and I was moving my children to a new city to West Hartford from Granby, Connecticut, and um, into this very big house. And I had always felt I needed to do everything on my own. So not only was somebody telling me it's time to slow down, I also was required to have girlfriends help clean my house after the movers came in. The girlfriends cleaned my house. They pulled out the fridge. They cleaned the fridge. They moved me into the new house and decorated it for me. And all the things I would never ask a soul to do because you're supposed to do that yourself if you're a powerful, capable woman. All right. And spirit said, okay, you got two weeks to get this lesson. All right. Everybody's going to be taking care of you. Every friend you've got is going to show up and help you move out and move in. And it did. It worked and life changed. You know, we learn the way we learn. We can take this gentle touch on the cheek or we get hit by a two by four. It's up to us what it takes for us to get the life lesson. And I suggest the more we can learn to deal with the gentle touch, gee, I think something isn't working. 
why don't we stop and look at what isn't working? Why wait for the two by four and say, whoa, I think something's not working here. We need to do some major control, some major damage control, you know? Give yourselves a break and do it easily. All right, if there are any other questions, I'm here. If not, we can call it an evening because again, I could talk forever. The Thank gift you very much. You're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's been an absolute joy. I'm really grateful you came. I do hope this helped and you get your health back, even if changing your perspective on what it means to be healthy. Being healthy does not mean not being ill. Being healthy means being vibrant and alive, filled with passion. And whether we've got one day or we've got 60 years left, it's doing it with all the passion and aliveness we have in our bodies. Surviving is not what we're here to do. We are not called to survive. We are called to live and live fully. Thank you so very, very much. Have a great evening. Thank what you, Daddy. Thank, thank you, Dr. Thank, 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 thank you so very you. much. Is there any way we can access the recording for this um, call? There is. My, my exquisite VA is here, Star. She'll be sending it out to everybody who attended. So oh, that's fabulous. Oh, Dr. D, Dr. D, that's Mrs. Tommy D saying, asking that question. <laughs> 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 I have my kids Tommy in the D. car too. <laughs> <laughs> I miss Thank Tommy you. D. That was so amazing. I really enjoyed listening to you. Oh, thank you so much. I'm here. You have any questions, please contact me. I'm available. All righty. All right. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Okay.